degrees. Get Linden Apple Center. Do you have any one test one operation to restrict area 2508? Area 31, Roger. Traffic is quite luminous and is exhibiting some non ballistic motion. Over. Roger, Area 31. Continue to send it to your discretion. Over. Okay, Center. The traffic is approaching head on, ultra right, and really moving. They're right by us right now. There are a thousand UFO sightings reported around the world every month. 90% of these sightings can be explained, but 10% cannot. Officially and unofficially, the U.S. military has been investigating UFOs since 1947. Their top secret goal is to find out what's behind these unexplained sightings. The Pentagon classifies them as unusual airborne anomalies, but a better term is X-Files. Join us now as Mac Wanwan and Commander Cobra explore these unsolved cases, UFO incidents that baffle even the U.S. military. This is Mac Maloney's Military X-Files. And now, here's Mac Maloney. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Mac Maloney's Military X-Files show here on the Distant Thunder Radio Network. This is Mac Maloney. Wow, what a show we have for you tonight. It's a special music show. Another segment of Mac Maloney's Musical X-Files. We have uh, quite a guest list tonight. Joining us later on will be Dr. Bob Gross. He is someone who has worked on secret government projects, and one of them... Believe it or not, was he was called on to make CDs, music CDs, sound a little more grittier. Grittier. He had to dirty them up. Dr. Bob Gross is going to be telling us about that. Also coming up later on, Brian Dunn, drummer for uh, All and Oats, also the house drummer for Daryl's House, great music show uh, that you can see just about everywhere. And uh, coming up after that, we're going to be talking to Jocko Johnson who feels that he has uh, solved the case of the murder of Bobby Fuller, the rock and roll murder of Bobby Fuller. He was found, Bobby Fuller was found right after he had a, a number one hit with uh, I Fought the Law and the Law One. He was found in his mother's garage after uh, somehow he ingested five gallons of gasoline. And so he died, Jocko Johnson, 10 years in the NYPD, thinks he has broken the case. So we'll see. But uh, just to start off here, we have a uh, very special guest in the studio, very rare appearance. Our good friend Lois Lane is here. Lois. Hi, Mac. I'm glad to be here. Are you really? I am. It's such an exciting show. Hmm. Okay, and it's just started, too, huh? Well, you have quite a range of topics. Okay. Now, let me just ask you this. Um, Were you born yet when Hollow Notes were big? Yes. You were, okay. (laughs) So you remember them? Absolutely. Oh, my goodness. Who didn't? Okay. Did you like them or? I did. Okay. Why? Because their songs were very catchy mm-hmm. and you could dance to them. You could dance. And I liked the words. Oh, they like, always okay. made you feel happy. Happy. Okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but I really like Daryl's House now. Mm-hmm. It's just a show that it's just it gets you into the other side of the mu- musicians. Mm-hmm. The musical like, experience, yeah, yeah, you know, and it just it just shows you that they're so very devoted and passionate about the music because mm-hmm. these varied musicians get together and play those different songs, mm-hmm. and the way they play them is different, and then they talk about it, and I don't know, you just get to see another side that you don't really. think think of them as regular guys getting together just jamming Mm -hmm. and that's what it brings out plus they have a cooking segment too well that's always fun too (laughs) right right. so if this is daryl's house i mean if you like music just go and google daryl's house they're on youtube they're on uh, a lot of different cable stations i forget which one we get them on but uh, it's easy to find basically daryl hall from hall notes started this um you know internet show and now it's uh grown much beyond that where he just has band and they play at a uh, club that he has up in upstate New York. They bring in musicians that you might not have you know, heard of. Some you've heard of, but some you might not have heard of. And they introduce you to that kind of music, to their kind of music. Or they'll bring in a, someone from a band who you might not have even thought about before. And it turns out this person's a really great musician and just fits right in with Daryl's you know, house band. And I'm talking about the Tommy Shaw episode that we saw the other night. Fabulous. Watched it from beginning to end and just wanted to see more. Tommy Shaw is like the rhythm guitar player for Sticks, And I got to tell you, you know, I'm not a big Sticks fan. I kind of missed that boat. 
and um, never really thought about them, really, you know. Uh, but then he was on. Turns out that he's a really good guitar player, fit right in with Narrow's band, and we're playing Sticks songs that actually sounded cool, right? I mean, is so that, cool. Different, you know? a, a different take of it. And again, that's where you see this um, interplay between all the musicians about how they just figure it out kind of on the spot. I'm sure they do some practicing ahead of time, but it just seems like they just gel. Mm, right. And they're such good musicians that that's, that's how they pull it off, you know. Right. So. Uh, so we'll be talking to Brian Dunn, who's been the drummer for uh, the Hollow Notes Band for about eight years. We'll be talking to him coming up later on. So why don't we do this? Lois, why don't we take a commercial break now, and then we'll get on with the show, okay? Sounds like a plan, Mac. Okay, you're listening to Mac Maloney's Musical X-Files here on the Distant Thunder Radio Network. Uh, once again, I guess it'll be Jocko Johnson coming up. Later on, Dr. Bob Gross, and also Brian Dunn, drummer for Hollow Notes. So please stay tuned. Do you know where the world's most secret bases are located? Do you know what spooky action at a distance means? Is there a conspiracy by aliens to prevent us from conquering space? And where is the best place in the United States to see a real UFO? Find the answers to all these questions and more in Mac Maloney's new book, Mac Maloney's Haunted Universe. Visit places you never knew existed. The Phantom Tunnels of Tokyo, the UFO Trail in South America, Hong's Hat, and the very mysterious M Triangle. Mac Maloney's Haunted Universe contains hundreds of reports on ghosts, haunted planes and ships, weird celebrity deaths, mysterious sounds, and a breakdown of every monster in America, state by state. You've heard him talk about it on the radio. Now, get all of Mac's paranormal research in one large volume. Mac Maloney's Haunted Universe, with a forward by the very famous Juan Juan. On sale now in your local bookstore or on Amazon.com. UFOs are found in Renaissance art, on ancient coins, and etched on cave walls. They're even reported in the Bible. But more surprising is when UFOs are seen the most in times of war. Through centuries, thousands of UFO sightings have been made by high-ranking officials, military pilots, and ordinary soldiers. Often, these fantastic appearances occur at the height of great battles. From World War I to D-Day to Korea, Vietnam, and beyond, military investigators are baffled. Why do UFO sightings spike so drastically during wartime? Could it be mistaken aircraft? Or is someone, or something, looking in on us? In UFOs in wartime, what they didn't want you to know, Mac Maloney chronicles centuries of these incredible sightings and tries to solve the puzzle of why so many UFOs are seen while humanity is at war. Read about the scare ships, the ghost planes, and the ghost rockets, alien giants in the jungles of Vietnam, UFOs controlling our ICBM bases, dogfights with flying saucers during the Gulf War, and more. 300 pages of unbelievable stories, along with many startling photographs. That's UFOs in Wartime, What They Didn't Want You to Know, by Mac Maloney. On sale at your local bookstore or on Amazon.com. everyone to Mac Maloney's Musical X-Files here on the Distant Thunder Radio Network. This is Mac Maloney. Why, what a show we have for you tonight. One of our uh, special music shows. Um, first of all, though, the bad news, girls, sorry. Uh, you can put the misters away for the time being. You don't have to unpack that big box or wipes or get your squeegee out because J.J. isn't here. He's on a secret mission. On a secret mission. He'll be back next week. Also, Mill Skills and Gigi Gills Coco, no Coco tonight. He is also on a secret mission. Whether they're together or not, I don't know. It's secret. It's secret. How would I know? <laughs> uh, also, I guess middle-aged women as well. No switchy tonight. No switch played Steve Ward up there. He's also on a secret mission. If the three of them together, 
Mm. Uh, together, I got to wait for the call for bail. They're plotting something right. good. Yeah, mm. oh, I can imagine that. More Larry and Curly <laughs> getting back into the game. So, anyway, however, from our regular cast, a good friend, our favorite, good witch up there in upstate New York, Raven is with us. Hello, Raven. Hello, my friends. So good to see everyone. Mm-hmm. No bun tonight. <laughs> no, I had it up in a bun and it, it looked like straight up trash. Okay. So had to take it down. Interesting. And this is, I mean, it is what it is. We're okay. a radio show. <laughs> <laughs> right. How true. Okay. Uh, also um, uh, joining us is our good friend Chris Billius, producer at uh, Bristol Studios in Boston. CB, how you doing? I'm doing great, Mac. Okay. And you're, uh, you're in your home studio, right? Yes, I rushed home from the other studio to get to this studio. Wow. I like this studio better. That's the studio I would like to have in my house with the keyboards hanging up. Everything looks cool. You know? Yeah, mm. fancy. It's the exact opposite of what my office at home is. But anyway, <laughs> uh, let's bring in someone uh, with a doctorate degree. Dr. Bob Gross, our good friend out there in Chicago, is joining us tonight. Musician slash UFO researcher. Dr. Bob, how you doing? Good. How's everyone? We're doing good. Yeah, thanks for joining us again on this uh, musical segment. And also, My pleasure. last but not least, is uh, training us in the uh, in the studio. Very rare occasion, Lois Lane is with us. That's the voice you've been hearing. Hi, Mac. Hi, everybody. It's good to be here. Okay. She uh, she claims that she knows uh, Hall & Oates, that they're around before. They're, how should I say it? <laughs> I was around. When Hall & Oates was around. Okay. Yeah. Ra- Raven, do you remember Hall & Oates? Yeah, I love Hall and really? Oates. Okay, yeah, see, right. okay. Yeah, okay. They're popular. Well, Ryan Dunn, the drummer from Hall and Oates, allegedly will be joining us later on in the show. But first of all, I just wanted to talk. Um, we, Dr. Bob and I were talking about uh, another topic off air a few weeks ago, and he happened to mention we were talking about whether what is the best way to reproduce music for people to listen to. Vinyl records, you know, seems to always win out. And I just read the other day that the vinyl record industry is now eight billion dollars. Eight billion dollars last year. Spent on vinyl records, that's quite a comeback because it was like, you know, 200,000 about five or six years ago. Um, and then uh, cassette tapes, not really. Eight track, people have told me eight track was actually a pretty good way to listen back to music because the tapes are so wide. And then we went to CD digital and really had um, a lot of people just don't like digital. They don't say, they say it's not warm enough. It doesn't sound like the original analog stuff. And we were talking about this, and then, Dr. Bob, you mentioned that at some point before CDs really became popular, you were called into this kind of secret meeting on how to make CDs not sound so antiseptic. Is that right? Yes, it was about how to make uh, digital music sound not so antiseptic. Now, first of all, why did they call you in? Why did they know to call you? Um. I was doing my doctoral work at Penn State at the time, and I was doing a uh, taking an advanced course in acoustics. And go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Oh, and at that time, Penn State didn't really. This would have been like 1980. Okay. Penn State did not have an advanced acoustics course, and I had already studied acoustics in my undergraduate work. So. uh, they made an arrangement with me where I studied for one semester with ENT doctors, and then I did a second semester with, on a special classified project on turning analog sound into digital sound. Okay. Because they were just starting to work on that back around 1980, and they were trying to find the ultimate digital sound so that they could do uh, like clarinet sounds and trumpet sounds and so forth on the new digital synthesizers. Because synthesizers back then were just coming out with digitally digitally controlled oscillators sure. and so forth. Okay. So, so what was the solution? I mean, I remember you mentioning a really cool name, Pink Noise. That sounds like a good name for a band. Yes. <laughs> uh, back then... Uh, I was working in a large studio at Penn State in the basement that had the old Moog synthesizers and a lot of electronic equipment 
and they used to call them, they were called Scully tape recorders that had like two inch tape and so forth. Mm. So you were uh, recording the highest quality. Mm. And what my assignment was, it was a uh, classified research project. Wow. For uh, Penn State, and I had to get clearance to do it, where I was trying to look at how to create an, the ultimate digital sound. And since I was a clarinetist back then, I was going to start with a clarinet. Mm -hmm. So I worked on an experiment where I took my clarinet out and I s recorded a sound in the electronic music studio. Okay. And I recorded it on a really high quality tape recorder, but it was analog sound. Yep. Analog, so we I should explain. That sound. Let me just explain. Uh, An analog is what they used to do before digital. Like analog, if you can think, analog is like tubes and, you know, and that kind of stuff. You know, like your old radio set. Right, Chris? Am I right? It's it's. Can you define analog for us real quick? Uh, you know, I look at it like uh, you have the real thing and then you have a photograph of something. <laughs> and digital is kind of a photograph of it whereas like analog is something actually vibrating or moving like you know in mm -hmm. the case of a clarinet a reed or a string would vibrate mm -hmm. you know whereas digital is just um like, it's kind of like uh old movies you know where they used to do the you, like the cartoons you can see the frames going yeah. you know by yeah. really quickly right bob am i yeah. doing it justice here Yes, the analog sound, the sound, and if you look at the sound itself, it's analogous to the sound, the acoustical sound. Mm -hmm. The digital is a bunch of dots lined up very close together instead of a, a, a line of sound. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I mean, so that's kind of it. In, in this, so it, it, then it lacks warmth. That's what I always hear is that digital just doesn't have the warmth of analog. Yes, there's, it lacks a lot of things. That's what we were finding out because <laughs> in the early days, we were trying to create a perfect acoustical sound. Like I was trying to create a, a perfect clarinet sound, but using digitized sound and not analog sound. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, it was actually really exciting times. So what I had to do is try to make the best perfect uh, sound recording of a clarinet. I played the clarinet just for like a second or so yep. on a really high quality Scully tape recorder and recorded it. Mm -hmm. And this was in a kind of a secret lab, electronic music lab that had all the old Moog equipment and so forth. Oh, cool. Okay. Right. So, so then, uh, and I had to have clearance to do this across the whole Penn State with all, a lot of different departments. So now I had this recording on tape of a clarinet sound, about a second of it. So then at night, now, now uh, Penn State also had two major areas where they had the large, they didn't even, they only had mainframe computers back then. Mm -hmm. So then at two or, th two or three o'clock in the morning, I had to take my tape over to one of those, you know, buildings. Yep. There were only two of them in the, in, on this campus. And I had to download that tape that was analog into the computers using something called an analog to digital converter. Okay, sounds good. So now all of that analog sound was turned into numbers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then th there was a special computer, a top secret computer that Penn State had at that time. This oh. was 1980. Yep. And I had to go into a, a non-discrete, it was cement bunker okay. in the basement of a lab yes. in, in, in uh, Penn State. Go ahead. And I had to go into this. It was called near uh, was called Old Main. And mm -hmm. I had to go into this building and I had special clearance to do this. Mm -hmm. so I would go down t into the elevator. I would go down to the basement. I'd get out of that elevator, walk across the basement, and there was a guard there at another <laughs> elevator oh, that would let me into that elevator. It would go down one more floor wow. to the special hybrid computer. Mm -hmm. So then when you got out in that lower basement, that sub-basement, it looked like a whole new world. It was like something you'd see on some science fiction movie. Yeah. And it was all like bars like in prison. Oh, okay. The whole thing was barred off. Okay. And then I had to walk up to the door. There was a door and like, you know, like a window you have for a movie theater. Yes. And I had to show my ID 
and they gave me a password. Mm -hmm. And then I, I had to use that password that they let me into this little building. Mm -hmm. Making a long story short, in this little building, this was like another science fiction movie. In the middle of this building, you know, they had like glass frames. Mm -hmm. You know, and in the middle of glass frame was this, they called it a hybrid computer. And there was this huge, you know, mainframe computer in this glass enclosed you know building i can see it and then there was a uh, a uh, a plotter not a printer there was a plotter inside that room with it mm -hmm. and outside the room in the perimeter were all what we call today like the uh they they were lap not laptop computers but your desktop the old desktop computers oh, yes. with the monitors oh yeah they'd never had those before oh wow I've had, I have, uh, I still have my Apple IIe at home with a monitor <laughs> yes, the size yes, of a Volkswagen, of right, yeah, okay, okay, <laughs> go ahead. Like that. So then I had to run a program called a, a fast Fourier transform on my digitized sound, and then I got to look at a clarinet sound and all the harmonics that were available on that sound, and then the strength of the intensity of each one of the harmonics. And uh, so then I could create using, let's, you know, uh, uh, electronic waves, mm -hmm. electronic generators, a, a perfect sound that sounded like a clarinet. Mm -hmm. But what we were finding out later, a clarinet, which we weren't, which we weren't putting in the sounds then, it has air going through a tube, you know. Uh, sure. So we had to add noise to a perfect electronic digital clarinet wow. sound wow. to make it sound like a, a true clarinet. Hmm. Now, was and that then, a surprise? Was that, did that come to you as a surprise that you had to kind of muddy it up a little bit for it to sound real, more real? Yes, because we, we were just looking at the sound. We forgot to look at what were called transients, the things that make up a, a musical sound that psychologically, they really affect you. Yes, sure. And you don't realize it. Funny. You know, it's like when you, how your fingers sometimes will slide across an acoustic guitar, yes. a guitar yep. string, mm -hmm. and how when a piano hammer hits, a, 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 that hammer hits a string, there's noise there. Mm -hmm. It's not sound, it's, it's noise. And so we would, I would experiment with using what's called white noise, yep. which is all the frequencies a human ear can hear randomly put together at the same amplitude okay and then there's pink noise which is white noise with the with the uh the low frequencies exaggerated and back then we also were working with what's called blue noise yes. which is white noise with the high frequencies exaggerated mm -hmm. so then you'd experiment with all of that and try to get a good sound then mm -hmm. and then you take it and maybe have you'd have i created what was called a preference test where you take it to maybe, you know, 50 or 100 people, and then those people would suggest which sound sounded best. Wow, wow, we. And, and then this, this research then went on to, you know, be uh, something they used in the seat when they were manufacturing CDs that made it that far? Well, they were CDs and uh, synthesizers. Mm -hmm. well. Because at that time, there was a company out of New York called the Krumar Company. Okay. We created the uh, first digitally controlled uh, synthesizer oscillator. So, Chris, let me just ask you now, um, the difference between, all right, let's just say analog records were made up until, I'm going to say, I don't know, the Beatles made Abbey Road on a digital recorder. So that was 1969. So really, a lot okay. of stuff before that was made on four-track analog recorders, right? Right. Okay, what is the, I mean, can you, as a, as because you're a producer, you're an engineer, you're a musician, can you hear the difference between, let's say, an old Beatles record and a Beatles CD? Um, yeah, I think I could. You know, it's funny, I just got a, a car, an old car, and it has, you know, a CD player, mm -hmm. and it has cassettes. Oh, and geez. I put in a cassette, and I haven't heard a cassette in like 20 years, right? Right. Go, oh, I wonder what this is. You know, it's probably an old band tape or something. Mm -hmm. I put it in there, and it was just like thumping. It was just really, uh, really full. It was like um, creamy. You know, it just had so much contour to it. It's like, well, maybe like the air was missing in the clarinet. You know, multiply that times like 
you know, mm -hmm. 20,000 or whatever, uh, you know, and put in all those missing pieces and you can hear it. Right. You know? Interesting. So, because yeah, it, it's there's definitely, you know, there's some nice things about digital too, though, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, yeah. They are clear and it's easy to work with. Oh my God, you know, cut, copy, paste. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, nothing quite uh, beats the uh, the analog sound. Uh, it, Although they're getting closer. Here's the interesting thing too: is that um, um, when you go when when the Beatles went to digital, just to use them as an example, they were the first ones to really record on a digital recorder, a track, and they were upset because there's a lot of the things that they used to do, these tricks that they would do with the analog recorder, mm -hmm. that they just couldn't do with the digital recorder. Now, as it turns out, you know, they found their way around it and they basically made Abbey Road uh, their last album on digital and it sounds great. Um, but a lot of people say that, uh, again, they go back and say, boy, I don't know, like Neil Young is someone who really is someone who, um, you know, has taken this to heart where he, he doesn't release his music on digital, I don't think. I think everything is kind of, you know, on analog or whatever. Really? That's Wow. wow. So anyway, hey, listen, that was interesting, Dr. Bob. And uh, why don't we take a quick break now, and we'll be right back after this. You're listening to Mac Maloney's Military x Show here on the Distant Thunder Radio Network. Please stay tuned. I was in the hospital with my son for 18 months. When he got injured, I wasn't prepared, but I knew I had to be strong. When I was told about John's injury, I was in complete shock. I just remember rushing into his room and giving him a big hug and letting him know I was there. These veterans and families are just a few of the heroes we serve at Homes for Our Troops. For thousands of severely injured veterans, everyday life is filled with barriers. It was really the, the little things throughout the house. Counters that you can't roll up to. I had to drag my wheelchair down steps. I want to help, but he is so determined. At Homes for Our Troops, we build specially adapted custom homes with features like wheelchair access, roll-in showers, and automatic door openers that allow them to function independently and focus on their recovery and family. This house is freedom. It's hope. It's a new beginning. This house has given me my family back. To learn more, visit hfotusa.org. British Secret Service. Hello, money, baby. Hello, 007. How's your mission to steal the secret sex formula from Dr. No-No, Lord? -No -No? You'll be going fine, ship for the two idiots headquarters shit with me. Hey, Mac, did Defalo Krumpus just call us idiots? Yes, he did, one one He's an ungrateful putz. Nice car, though. Yeah, and you know what? Now it's my turn. But if you drive, what am I going to do? I I'll drive. You shoot the machine guns. Okay? No way, I'm you driving. Too I'm just driving. a license for you and I'm driving. Oh, see what I mean, Money Penny? James, we have to get the stolen formula, Dr. No-No, before the big two-for-one sale. I'm on it, honey, honey, but I've got to rid myself of these two marshmallows first. Uh, well, uh, I still have the red button, don't I? James, not the red button. Cobra, save us. Hello, gentlemen. And you, Mr. Pond. Oh, my God. Is that Commander Cobra? Jumping from a helicopter through the shell roof of my Ashton Martin? Well played, Cobra. But what are you doing here? Besides rescuing my two friends, James, I'm here to tell you that you don't have to steal the cardio sex formula from Dr. No-No. All you have to do is go online and order it yourself. And then you'll have plenty of the new energy drink that can give you the extra endurance you need to get through. Please, Cobra, tell us why it's called sex. It's called SEX for Strength Energy Accelerator. And it's easy to use. Just mix a scoop of water, shake it, not stir it. 30 minutes before you start your workout, and you'll find you can last longer and feel all around better about finishing your regime. Oh, my. And the mix comes in many different flavors. My favorite is passion fruit. Mine, too. Why, you little trollop. Hey, Mac, look at all these buttons. I wonder what they do. I don't know. Push one and find out. Not, not, not the, the big red, red, red one. No! Geez, I hope he's wearing his rocket belt. Guess not. That's SEX Workout Dietary Supplement, available only through Cardillo USA. Visit CardilloUSA.com for more details about our big two-for-one sale. That's C-A-R-D-I-L-L-O-U-S-A.com. And get some sex today.
Welcome back, everyone, to Mac Maloney's Musical X-Files here on the Distant Thunder Radio Network. This is Mac Maloney. Wow, what a show we have for you tonight, our musical show of the month. Um, no JJ, no Coco, and no Switchy tonight. But with us is uh, a good friend, Chris Billius, producer from uh, Bristol Studios in Boston. Chris, CB. Hey, how are you? Okay. I'm envious good of your uh, studio there. Uh, also, our good friend, Dr. Bob Gross, out there in Chicago, the toddle in town. Dr. Bob. Hello. Hello. Okay. You At one time, you played in like four different bands, including an, uh, uh, an Augusta, right? Yes. Okay. In the 60s? In the 60s and the 70s, yes. Okay. You were driving around in a TR1, you told us? <laughs> uh, Spitfire. Spit, wow. Okay. We oh, I'm trying. Spitfire. Was that just to rub it into the other musicians? Sort of. <laughs> yeah, we could sort of. Plus, I didn't have to haul anybody else around. That's good, anybody. yeah. <laughs> okay. Also with us is uh, a good friend, Raven, up there in um, upstate New York. Raven, how you doing? No bun tonight. Hello, my friends. No bun. No bun. The bun did not make an appearance. It's bunless. <laughs> okay. And also making a very special appearance here in the studio is... Uh, is Lois Lane, our favorite. I don't know what you are. You're just our favorite there, Lois, okay? <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm excited to hear about music tonight. Okay. And uh, our special guest uh, for tonight, uh, we've been waiting for a couple months for this, is uh, Brian Dunn, drummer of Hall & Oates Band and also Daryl's House Band. Let's give him a round of applause, yeah. and we'll sweeten that up in post, okay? <laughs> Brian, how are you doing? Brian. How are you guys? I'm good. I'm good. How are you guys? Good. Now, where are you right now? Because um, I know Holland Oats has been out on tour recently, right? Yes, we just we just did a five week run and I uh, got home four days ago. Oh, really? Where I'm is home in wow. Long Island, New York? Oh, Long Island. Wow, that's where Lois is from, Long wow. Island. Holy cow! Yeah. Okay, whereabouts in Long Island? We have to ask you now. I, um, I'm originally from North Babylon, and but I live in a town called Ronkonkoma. Oh, oh, my yeah. goodness, of oh, course. That's right where Lois grew up. Yeah, I went to Stony Brook, and I grew up in Bayport. Nice. Yeah. nice. yeah. The first time and first and only time I've been on Long Island is when I got married, right? Yeah. Well, yes. You were there. Okay. <laughs> I think so. Anyway. Uh-huh. <laughs> so listen, Brian, we get a lot of questions to ask you, but first of all, I just want to tell, and we tell people this on the show all the time anyway, is that if you if, if anyone is just a fan of music or want to just go look at something different in you know the musical scene, just watch Daryl's House. I tell people this all the time. You know, no matter what kind of music you like, watch that. It's always a great experience. And what it, what is good for me, and for I know a lot of other people, is that they, you'll bring in some guests who, you know, I normally would not have heard, you know, and then all of a sudden you're into their music because the way you guys, meaning the band, play their songs, they're different and all of a sudden, you have an interest in them. And I'm, and I'm going to say this. The best example to me is <clears throat> the Tommy Shaw episode, which they've been repeating. Okay? Tommy Shaw is in Sticks. Okay, fine. You know, if you like Sticks, cool. They were successful. You know, nothing. You can't say anything bad about them, really. Just a different kind of music. He came in and played with you guys, and all of a sudden, he's almost saying, this is better than Sticks, right? I mean, <laughs> he almost came out and said it. <laughs> Well, that that band is actually really, really good. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, he he. It's nice. It's nice when those artists come in. They uh, usually you have a. They're used to having a set band and a set way of doing things. So it when we when we do it, it's a little loose and a little different. And sometimes that's it has a charm because of that. Yeah, right. Um, it's a good word. I don't know that they would want it to be that way. You know, if they wanted it that way, they would have their own band doing it that way. But the fact that it's something new and different. It's probably uh, uh, something that's refreshing. Right, sure. Well, even even for him now, that was interesting because, you know, you kind of knew who he was. But first of all, I had no idea he was such a good guitar player. I mean, he was really impressive playing the guitar, oh. you know. And, Killing. And, and the way that you got, the way that he kind of mixed in with you guys, it, it, it's funny because the, we watched the episode again this weekend. And he, he almost was a little apprehensive when he comes in and meets you guys and everything. But the next thing you know, they're playing these stick songs and they sound way cool. And I said, wow, this is something This is something else that you can make stick songs sound cool. But they, but you did, you know. And, and it's, it's because of the band. Let's face it, the band is really good. Mm-hmm. Um, let me just read off. This is the, these are my heroes. Okay, of course, Daryl Hall plays, you know, guitar. But also, um, 
your league top player, there, Shane Terrell, is that how you spell his? Uh, you pronounce his last name? Sh- Sh- Shane Terrio. Terrio, okay, fantastic guitar mm-hmm. player, right? Elliot yeah. Lewis. Oh yeah. One, Elliot Lewis on keyboards. He's one of these guys you can tell he can play anything at the drop of a hat. You know, I hate people like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Clyde Jones, great bass player. You know, great bass player. Porter is a Porter Carroll. Is he looks like a character to me? He's like more percussion, harmonizing, great voice, and also. Um, Charlie DeCant, which is the, is the sax player, who is like really Mr. Cool. They call him Mr. Cool. Mm-hmm. But now, you guys get together, you and Elliot and um, and Clyde. You were in the Average White Band for a while, right? Yes. For uh, Elliot was there first for almost ten years, and then I joined the band, and we we did it together for about a year and a half. Mm-hmm. Then he left the band and Clyde came in and I did it with Clyde for another four and a half, five years. Mm-hmm. And then I left mm-hmm. and then Clyde continued to do it for almost 10 years himself. So, yeah, we're all we all come from the AWB. And actually, something that many people don't know, Porter Carroll um, is actually a drum set player. Interesting. And, and, a, and, a, and a ridiculous lead vocalist. And he was he kind of created the band. um uh, Atlantic Star, oh, yeah. um, which is an R and B band from the eighties, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. they had a lot of hits actually, and they they had a lot of success. And Porter was the first drummer asked to join AWB when Steve Ferroni left. Wow! So he's actually he he never wound up doing a tour with them, but technically he was in AWB for a couple of seconds anyway. Oh, so wow. it was four okay. of us. Cool. <laughs> So then, how do you make that transition to the to the Daryl Hall house band? Um, for me personally, I came in as just a sub for the television show before I did anything, mm-hmm. um, and that was from T Bone Walk, the old oh, uh, yeah. the ex uh, MD, um, and from becoming the sub for the television show, um, it was you know I treated it. I mean I don't treat it like a one off, but it was basically can you just cover for this drummer, Sean Pelton? Mm-hmm. Um, and I said, yeah. And, uh, and it went well. And I became the quote unquote sub of the, of the television show. Um, and then because of that, I wound up subbing for the drummer who does the Hall and Oates gig. And I became the sub for that. So I, uh, for a little bit, I was the sub, just a sub for both of those gigs. Yes. And then one day they just gave me both of them. Wow, cool. Wow. wow, that's neat. Yeah. I saw an interview with you uh, earlier, and you were talking about how your two brothers are actually uh, were pretty, um, they, they loom large in how you became a musician, right? You used to listen to all their oh, yeah. stuff, right? Seven years older than me. Okay. At that point, people were still, at least where we live, you know, they were still in that generation where kid teenagers are getting together and having band rehearsals. I had none of that in my experience in high school, hmm. zero. Um, but my brothers had band, had all their friends played instruments and band rehearsals were always at my house. Mm. So I got to witness a lot of it. Yes. Yes. Okay. And that's it. You got the bug from seeing what was going on, right? Yeah. I'm assuming. Okay. All yeah, right. pretty much. Now I got to ask you, what are they doing these days in the music biz? What are they lawyers or something? <laughs> yeah, then they're, they're not lawyers. They're not in the music business at all. Actually. Well, okay. What do they yeah, think they of you? Of... What do they think of you being a success in the music business? Yeah, they're really happy. Yeah, I can believe it. They're yeah. really happy. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> the little brother makes good. Yeah, why not, right? <laughs> so, well, listen, we do this to all our musical guests. Maybe now's the time to do it. We give this musical IQ quiz, okay? We don't expect you to oh know. <laughs> you don't expect you to know the answers, but, you know, if you do know the answers, uh, there might be prizes at the end. So, <laughs> so um, Raven, you have okay. the list, right? Rave? I have the okay. list. All right, here we go. I did not write these. Okay. Oh, pff, wow, excuse me. I did me. not write these. Okay. All right. <laughs> oh, boy. Wow. As a disclaimer. <laughs> You've talked to a lawyer. Okay. All right. So here we go. <laughs> Top 10 questions to ask one of our musical guests, please. Number 10, Raven. What do bass players use for birth control? What do bass players use for birth control, Brian? Uh, oh, my God. <laughs> go ahead raven go ahead give him the answer i don't know i don't give me a hint <laughs> i'll give you the answer their personalities the personalities oh, oh my god see, right. see where we're coming from here we got nine more ready okay. <laughs> okay all right please number nine please raven 
Uh, what's the difference between a music? What, what's the difference between a musician and a pizza? What's the musician? What's the difference between a musician and a pizza? Chris knows this one. Pizza can feed a family of four. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. Okay. Oh, my goodness. One and one. All right. Here we go. Number uh, eight, please. Number eight. What is the, what's the definition of perfect pitch? What's the definition of perfect pitch? <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Raven. Oh, see. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> when you throw a banjo in the dumpster and it hits an accordion. There you go. <laughs> oh, uh, okay, here we go. I Numbers. thought maybe there's going to be a bagpipe in there somewhere. No, well, that, that's we changed it. We changed it to accordion. Go ahead. Next one, please, Raven. Number seven. What do you call a guy who hangs around with musicians? Oh, this is cruel. What do you call this a guy who cruel. hangs around musicians? <laughs> A drummer. Right. Okay. Yes. <laughs> He's got two. <laughs> you already got the best score of any guest we've ever had. Next one, yeah, please. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> right. Number six. What phrase will you never hear from a banjo player? What phrase will you never hear from a banjo player? <laughs> uh, oh. Oh, I can't think of any. Go, Raven. Tell him. That's my Porsche. That's my Porsche. Uh, ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Next one, please, Raven. Number five. What do you throw a drowning bass player? What do you throw a drowning bass player? Mm. His amp. Yes. Wow. <laughs> oh, my God. oh. You got three of them. Holy. Oh, You're doing so good. <laughs> You've already beaten Tom Brislin of Kansas. Believe me, he got he got one. <laughs> okay. Next question, please, Raven. Four. We have. A drummer and a bass guitarist catch a cab in New York City. Who's the real musician? Okay, a drummer and a bass guitarist catch a cab in New York City. Who's the real musician? A cab driver. Yes. Oh, wow. Yes. We're going to have to give this guy a prize. Wow, you do. You owe it. <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow. Okay, please. Next one, Raven. Next one. Uh, number three. What are the three most difficult years in a bass player's life? What are the three most difficult years in a bass player's life? Oh, uh, uh, I'm not going to get it right, so it's... Go ahead, Ray. Yeah, give it some... The second grade. The second grade. Oh, <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, oh wow. These are okay. really harsh. Please, next one, Ooh. Raven. Uh, number two, what's the difference between a dead chicken in the road and a dead trombonist in the road? What's the difference between a dead chicken in the road and a dead trombonist in the road? The chicken was on his way to a gig. Oh, man, come on. Oh How do you goodness. know these things? <laughs> He's probably heard of you wow. before. Okay. All right. All right. We're going to have to give him something. Okay. Uh, okay, please. The, I think this is the last one. Yeah, more than a round of applause. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ray. This is the last one. Okay. Uh, how do you get a trombonist off your front porch? How do you get a trombonist <laughs> off your front porch? Oh, um. Wow. Go ahead, Raven. I, I don't have it. No? Okay. Me. Pay him for the pizza. Pay him for the oh. pizza. <gasps> oh, my heavens. <laughs> okay, wow. All right, glad. Wow, you got five for five. Let's give him a real round of applause. You did so good. <laughs> Very impressive, Brian. <laughs> well, listen, why don't we do this? So, um,. Why don't we take a quick break now, I mean really quick, and then we'll be right back, okay? You're listening to Mac Maloney's Musical X-Files here on the Distant Thunder Radio Network. We'll be right back after uh, this. UFOs are found in Renaissance art, on ancient coins, and etched on cave walls. They're even reported in the Bible. But more surprising is when UFOs are seen the most in times of war. Through centuries, thousands of UFO sightings have been made by high-ranking officials, military pilots, and ordinary soldiers. Often, these fantastic appearances occur at the height of great battles. From World War I to D-Day to Korea, Vietnam, and beyond, military investigators are baffled. Why do UFO sightings spike so drastically during wartime? Could it be mistaken aircraft, or is someone, or something, looking in on us? In UFOs in wartime, what they didn't want you to know, Mac Maloney chronicles centuries of these incredible sightings and tries to solve the puzzle of why so many UFOs are seen while humanity is at war. 
Read about the scare ships, the ghost planes, and the ghost rockets. Alien giants in the jungles of Vietnam. UFOs controlling our ICBM bases. Dogfights with flying saucers during the Gulf War, and more. 300 pages of unbelievable stories, along with many startling photographs. That's UFOs in Wartime, What They Didn't Want You to Know, by Mac Maloney. On sale at your local bookstore or on Amazon.com. British Secret Service. Hello, Money Baby. Hello, 007. How's your mission to steal the secret sex formula from Dr. No No No? It'll be going fine, except for the two idiots headquarters shit with me. Hey, Mac, did Defolo Krumpus just call us idiots? Yes, he did, one one. He's an ungrateful putz. Nice car, though. Yeah, and you know what? Now it's my turn to take but if you drive, what am I going to do? I'll drive, you shoot the machine guns. So no way, I'm driving. driving too much. I just have a license for you and I'm driving. Oh, see what I mean, Money Penny? But James, we have to get the stolen formula, Dr. No-No, before the big two-for-one sale. I'm on it, Money Penny, but I've got to rid myself of these two mushmouths first. Uh, what? Huh? I still have the red button, don't I? James, not the red button. Cobra, save us. <laughs> Hello, gentlemen. And you, Mr. Pond. Oh, my God. Is that Commander Cobra? Jumping from a helicopter through the shell roof of my Ashton Martin? Well played, Cobra. But what are you doing here? Besides rescuing my two friends, James, I'm here to tell you that you don't have to steal the cardio sex formula from Dr. No-No. All you have to do is go online and order it yourself. And then you'll have plenty of the new energy drink that can give you the extra endurance you need to get through. Please, Cobra, tell us why it's called sex. It's called SEX for Strength Energy Accelerator. And it's easy to use. Just mix a scoop of water, shake it, not stir it. 30 minutes before you start your workout, and you'll find you can last longer and feel all around better about finishing your regime. Oh, my. And the mix comes in many different flavors. My favorite is passion fruit. Mine, too. Why, you little trollop. Hey, Mac, look at all these buttons. I wonder what they do. I don't know. Push one and find out. Not, not, not the, the big red, red one. No! Jeez, I hope he's wearing his rocket belt. Guess not. That's SEX Workout Dietary Supplement, available only through Cardillo USA. Visit CardilloUSA.com for more details about our big two-for-one sale. That's C-A-R-D-I-L-L-O-U-S-A.com. And get some sex today. Everyone to Mac Maloney's Musical Exiles here on the Distant Thunder Radio Network. This is Mac Maloney. Wow, what a show we have for you tonight. Very quickly, let me tell you who's with us. Uh, Chris Billius, producer at Bristol Studios in Boston. Is he a CB? How you doing? Hey, doing great, Mac. Okay. Enjoying this tonight. Also, Dr. Bob Gross out there in Chicago, the toddle in town, saxophone player and UFO researcher. Dr. Bob, how are you? Hello. Fun night tonight. Yeah, so far anyway. Um, also, our good friend uh, Raven, the Good Witch, is uh, with us. Raven, bunless tonight, no bun. <laughs> hello, hello. <laughs> also, <It was> musical. <laughs> also, uh, Lois Lane is joining us in the studio tonight. Very rare occasion. Lois, thanks for coming in. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Okay. And our uh, special guest is uh, Brian Dunn, who is the um, drummer for the Hall and Oates Band and also for Daryl's House house band so now daryl's house the 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 um thank you brian for joining us we really appreciate it oh, thanks for having me man and you just uh you just wound up did you say five weeks on on the road with hollow notes yes okay so how many how many shows approximately in those five weeks um the the general uh it's usually we do a show and we, and we always drive to the next we always get to the next city and have a day off Okay. Sometimes it's two or three days off, so it's we're, it, the, the load is actually not that heavy when compared to some of the other bands I've played with. Right. Um, so, yeah, it's. I mean, it averages out to probably a day on, a day off, or a day on, two days off. Right. But you you play in, in front of some very large crowds, right? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're they're basically all the gigs are kind of the audiences are large, large for every every show at this mm-hmm. point. Okay. Do you get nervous before a show? Uh, I don't get nervous because I'm in front of people per mm-hmm. se. I I may get a little nervous because I want because I know what. Well, I think I know what what good is <laughs> and what okay. I'm capable of. So yes, I yes. want to perform at my best. So it's more of, it's more about myself more than uh, the audience. Mm-hmm. So the, the size of the audience doesn't really matter to me. Wow, interesting. Okay, now now um, you're in it. Then this band. We should just go back and talk about the band a little bit too, because again, because. I remember reading that Eric Clapton's band a few years ago. People said that, you know, he had the best touring band, the best. But I think you guys are better than his band, to tell you the truth. And he had, you know, people like Nathan East in it. And, you know, these and – Paul, and, and Paul Gadd, is that his name? Paul Gadd, the drummer? Steve Gadd. Steve Gadd. S- Steve Gadd. Great drummer, yeah. you know. So, but, but Amazing. There's something about you guys. No, just tell us the secret. So what happens? Now, you know that someone like the OJs are coming, right? How far in mm-hmm. advance do you know – that you're going to be playing OJ songs. This is for the show now. We basically we usually know we usually know who the guest is going to be, you know, over a month in advance. But usually a week before the band the, the, the artist is going to show up, we'll get our songs. It's usually four songs to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, we almost always will get just the original recorded versions of those songs, not like current live versions. Okay. Um, oh, wow. And we basically do our own individual homework. And the way Daryl likes to run it is he, he basically counts on us to do our homework. And he doesn't do a whole lot of homework, actually. Okay. Um, <laughs> and they do. And I, I believe they let the artists know this, too. Like, don't count on this stuff being exactly like your recorded version. It's going to be a, it's going to be a version for that day. Right. You know, um, and Daryl basically, I, I don't know how to verbalize this. He kind of counts on us that we know what's going on with the music. Yep. And he lo- he loosely knows it. And he's got the kind of ears where. If he hears the the sort of harmonic movement, he kind of just riffs over the top. Mm-hmm. He's not really concerned with learning anything exactly the way it was. Right. Um, and then we all collectively sort of, you know, if he takes it somewhere or if the form changes on the fly, we just have to kind of follow it. Right. Um, the other thing I'll say is he's very adamant. This is Daryl speaking of. Mm. His thing is let's we, we talk about because we never rehearse. The day the artist shows up, Damn. we meet the artist. We, we talk about the first song we're going to play. We we verbally talk about the form, mm-hmm. and we play. And he tells us we're not stopping. Cameras are rolling. Yep. We play it for the first time, start to finish, for better or for worse. And then at that point, that's the artist's chance to discuss what he wants or she wants changed. Mm-hmm. And then we play it usually. I would say 85% of what you hear is the second time we've played the song. Yeah. And we just got to live with it. There's no listening back either. We don't get to hear back what we did at all. So we is find out like four months later. Wow. Do, do you do any so sweetening it's, it's up? It's kind of scary. Is it, is, it, is it sweetened up in the in the post-production or anything? It doesn't sound it. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they definitely, I mean, we're in the room. It definitely does not sound produced the way you're hearing it. Okay. Um, but it is what it is. Yes. And that's why if you listen closely, there's a lot of moments of looseness. There's wrong notes. There's mistakes here and there. But <laughs> Daryl, you know, that's the other thing. I personally have gone to him and said, hey, man, why don't we just play these tunes like six times? <laughs> and as a drummer, my job is not to play along. My job is to tell everybody, OK, this next section's coming. And yeah. it's my job to play something to let everybody else know that it's coming. Yes. So I, I have to be ahead of everybody. Um and in this case, we can't. I can't always do that because we're, I'm flying at the seat of my pants. So, um, but his retort to me was, "Oh, he, was, he goes. I know what you're going to do. He goes, you and all these guys in the band, you're all going to craft the perfect little performance for the song after the fifth or sixth time." He's like, "I have no interest in that. There's nothing interesting about that. Let's just play it. As soon as we get through it, 
we'll just live with that. Mm-hmm. And he's got the guts to actually do it. So. Right, right. Well, that's what they say. Rock and roll music is, you know, other guests have told us, you know, they just it, there's no rules to it. You just go out and play. You go out and play it. You know, it's, it, you don't have to. Like we asked Tom Brizen, he he took over for the keyboard player for Kansas. He was on about six months ago, and he's. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and, and Kansas music is like yes music, uh, ELP or whatever. You know, it seems very, very sure. structured and so on. He says they just the same thing. He just sent me, you know, they said cover this, cover this part, cover this part. You know, it's a live performance. It doesn't have to be, you know, perfect. Um, so that's kind of what you're saying. You know, what, what it isn't what, they, what you see is what you get, but it is kind of like this is what we're doing. This is the, this is the song, and it always sounds great on the – on the TV show. I mean, really. Uh, I'm impressive. amazed at the quality of those recordings playing back. Yeah, our sound man is pretty amazing. His name is Pete Moshe. He's, uh, it's pretty remarkable what you guys hear because, like, he, like, we, we're playing with a PA system right there in the room. Like, the vocals are screaming right. loud. Hmm. And it's not conducive to to having a nice studio recording. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's it's a sonic mess. Hmm. But, you know, because everybody's going in direct, he's able to work it out. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. an odd, it's cool. an odd form then because it, it's, do you ever watch the show? Do you watch yourself on the show? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Usually in horror because I want it to be better. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's interesting. Well, wow. well, listen, let's get, let's get to this list of drummers. All right. And just, you tell us what you okay. think. Okay. All right. It's a long list. Juan Juan gave me this list. Okay. Here we go. Ready? Okay, every list has to start out with Ringo. Uh, of course. <laughs> I mean, what can you say? Amazing. You know, the, all the hits, the, that feel, it's, it's uh, yeah, I mean, not much to say there. Right. Sort of an icon. Right, And yeah. he seems like a really cool guy, by the way. Yeah, we've yeah, we've known people who have known him who have come on and they've, they've told some an- anecdotes. He's an interesting guy. Uh, Charlie Watts just pa- just passed away. Almost the same, you know, Ringo, same yeah. kind, small drum kit, but big, 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 right? Yeah, 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 no. absolutely. And and that whole, you know, he's forever going to be known as the guy that plays the rock beat and he leaves the leaves the eighth note out on the hi-hat that yeah. matches the snare drum. Yeah, so the phantom, like the yeah, phantom great. hit, you know? Yeah, the phantom hit, yeah. It, we saw them about, we saw them two years ago at Gillette Stadium with a Patriots play. And I had never seen them. And I was, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, I was a fan, but I wasn't like a big fan. But I just wanted to go see if the... If the hype was real, you know, if it was real, mm-hmm. and it is real, they're fantastic. I mean, yeah. just, have you seen them? Have you seen them yeah. play? I've never seen them live, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, you got to see them. Yeah, and they, they'll have Steve Jordan with them now. He's another one of the people on the list. He's oh, going to be playing drums. That's, but, that's one of my heroes, man. Yeah, we we were sitting there, and and twenty seconds into this, I was with uh, co-host Juan, who isn't here tonight, and I just turned to him. I says, "Wow, it's great. It's true. You know, I mean, they really are great." And the show they put on, and every every song is a hit, and just the way they work the crowd, really, really, yeah. really impressive, you know? I mean, I came away being a fan, and I don't want to go see another concert because I don't think it will be as good as that, you know? Okay, here we go. Ready? Yeah. Number three, uh, Keith Moon. Keith Moon. Keith Moon, man. I mean, when I was a little kid, I remember my brothers playing playing that music, and uh, yeah, yeah, amazing. <laughs> yes. And uh, aggressive and... Yeah. Right. At one point, bad, he's a badass. He's at one a badass. <laughs> at, at one point, he had twenty-two drums in his kit, and they said because they didn't want he didn't want to miss any of them. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. He he played different than anyone else. He was just you know he could only have played in that band. That's what's cool about that. That's like you know three tornadoes going in different directions or four. Um, okay. Let's yeah, see. and he had a cool swing about his playing too. Mm-hmm. It never played the same song a twice. Rock, a lot of English, a lot of English rock drummers have that. They were fans of American jazz, and a lot of them have a little swing factor to their mm-hmm. to their fills when they go to play fills. Yeah, Charlie Watts. He was a jazz drummer who happened to be in a rock band. You know that happens a lot. It seems. Um, John Bonham, Led Zeppelin, easily one of my favorites. Easily one of my favorites. As a matter of fact, I was today. My son and I were playing along with the ocean, and my bro- I was showing my son how to play in seven. Mm-hmm. Oh really? Okay. Wow. Please. <laughs> That's he... so cute. That's cool. <laughs> How old is your son? How old is this kid? He he just turned thirteen. Thirteen, wow. yeah. And did he get it? Is wow. he does yeah. he is he does he get it? What's that? Does he get it? You know? Does he know? Oh, he gets it. Yeah. He gets it. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, yeah. And... I don't know if he loves it. I mean, oh, okay. He doesn't love it. Not yet anyway. But if he ever decided he wanted to, he's got it. 
Yeah. Whatever it is, he's got it. Wow. Cool. Does he think it's just yeah. extra specially cool that his dad is this, you know, musician on TV and touring around? He, I think I I think he does, but at the same time, when I want to show him something on the drums, it's kind of a drag because I'm, no matter what, I'm still dad. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of it's it goes the opposite way than you would think sometimes. Uh-huh. <laughs> Yeah, so. I can see that. I don't know, though, like cause coming from somebody who didn't have a drummer that was a, a drummer that was a dad, a dad that was a drummer. A famous drummer. Yes. Yeah, sure. No, that would just blow my mind. I know. That looking at it from the Trump outside. Trombone's a good career, too. Trombone's a good career. Uh, or, or banjo. Or banjo. I love the banjo. Banjo's great. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, Hal Blaine. Hal Blaine, the drummer for the Wrecking Crew. Oh my God! Yeah, all those hits, mm. crazy, yep. crazy. The Wrecking Crew Amazing. played played on like eighty percent of the number one hits in the you know late sixties, early seventies. A lot of people say, remember the oh, guy yeah. from some guy from one band said, I found out that Hal Blaine is is like ten of my top ten drummers. He's the same guy, <laughs> yeah, because they would yeah, play on that makes sense. Yep, he play on rock yeah, songs. Our, our, guitar, our, our guitar player Shane Terry, he's a big fan. Of that whole wrecking crew, that mm-hmm. whole all a lot of those recordings, Beach Boys fan, and, yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm going yeah, through the list. Bad. Buddy Rich, Buddy Rich, Jeez. famous old jazz drummer. Freak of nature. Yeah, yeah. Freak mm-hmm. of nature. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Yep. Amazing. My high school band director was on the road with him for many years. Oh, is that right? Yeah. He wasn't. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He wasn't a touchy feely guy, of what I've heard. You know, he wasn't warm and fuzzy. I, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> um, but if you could play, I mean, I'm sure he was, he, you know, it was a good experience. He, lo- he loved the experience of playing in the band. So. I'll bet. Um, Stuart Copeland from The Police. Oh, man. Amazing. If you don't Amazing. like him, it's okay. And such, such an identifiable voice. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Alan, how about Alan White? Of, um, you play with John Lennon, George Harrison, also plays with Yes. Yeah, man, of course. Absolutely. Absolutely. Those that that's my memories from being a teen, teenager with my my brothers because they were listening to more rock and roll. So mm-hmm. and especially progressive rock stuff. So right. Do you like that uh, music at all, or do you? Uh, what do you think of prog rock? You, you can you know, tell us. You can tell. I us. mean, when I was in sixth, I was in sixth grade in elementary school. I would every day I was playing along with the Hemispheres Rush record, record mm-hmm, and right. that was progressive to me. Yeah. Um, I never got into the newer progressive stuff, um, like Dream Theater and stuff like that, although I know that they're great. Um, I'm not, I became more of an R&B fan at a pretty young age, mm-hmm. so I didn't go that way. Um, and as my brothers, I just kind of followed with whatever my brothers did. And my brothers went from kind of rock and roll to R&B to straight ahead jazz. Mm-hmm. And I kind of just followed suit. Yeah, that's the progression a lot of people kind of take, you know. They get they love mm-hmm. rock. Then they go to R&B or blues, and then somehow they go to jazz, you know? Can, mm-hmm. can you explain jazz in one sentence? <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> mm. Okay. Um, I mean, yeah, that's that's a loaded word. Um, I mean, there's a lot of people that created it that don't even like that it's called that to begin with. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I... I uh, I mean, my brother's. My brother became. You know what it is. As you, when you, when you're getting better at a, at an instrument, no matter what it is, um, you start to you start to find out about who the people you love to listen to, what they were listening to. Interesting. And a lot of times, it it it, go, it points toward that. So you know, if you're listening, if you're a fan of of Neil Peart, mm-hmm. there's a pretty good chance that at a certain point in his life, Neil Peart was probably a fan of of Buddy or Max Roach. Mm-hmm. You know. Mm-hmm. So then, then you can't help but say, "Well, who's that guy?" Next thing you know, you're listening to Max Roach records with, with, you know, and you're discovering who Clifford Brown is, and then now you're listening to jazz. So it's, right. I think that's how it happens. Wow, that's interesting. Uh, as um, we we're now on the list, Steve Jordan. Steve Jordan is someone who is going to be taking over for the Rolling Stones, and uh, he was Charlie mm-hmm. Watts' favorite drummer. I mean, imagine that. I mean, he he really. I, I saw him yeah. with the expensive winos. He's played with Keith Richards and everything, but he's really kind of a unique drummer, I think. Oh my God, easily one of my favorites. Easily, I mean, no, no question, top five. Mm-hmm. Easily, yeah, wow. And and you know, he's he's uh, and the other drummer that plays with the expensive winos, Charlie Drayton, another one of my favorites. Who mm-hmm. they would switch off on bass and drums. And these are both guys that 
play can play rock and roll and can play R and B, and they really capture the essence of of everything they play. And and they no matter how many years go by, they they also will never sound dated. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. Which is which is a testament to why they get inside. They really get inside the essence of whatever music they're playing. Right. Okay. Just a couple more. Steve Picaro from Toto. Jeff Picaro. Jeff Picaro. Sorry, Steve is his brother. Yeah. 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 Oh, another one. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. I, I don't know what to say. You know. Yep. I Easily mean, one of the greats. He, yeah. It was just it was funny because I was just watching a YouTube maybe a couple of years ago and, and there was a YouTube with Steve Lukather, who was the guitar player for Toto. And again, I never really thought about Toto, frankly. You know, I know they had a couple of hits back in the 80s. But he told this great story mm -hmm. about how he was recording with George Harrison. I, I kind of looked into Toto and then, you know, really kind of found out. I think, in my opinion, I think they had the wrong name because they were all really good musicians. They were like incredible session musicians. Um, they had oh, been, yeah. They're playing on um, Silk Degrees. I mean, uh, Boss Eggs, like huge. They're playing albums. On, on Michael Jackson too. They're playing on huge hits. Mm -hmm. And just, just some of that stuff. Come in and do it, you know. And 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 um, I think they just had the wrong name because you see them in concert, you see some of their live performances on in YouTube, and they're fantastic. Mm -hmm. They really are. And Toto, I don't yeah. know. Toto just, I don't know. Has I think they should have come up with a better name, frankly. <laughs> you know, they did all right for themselves, but. <laughs> You know, um, Lukatha said when they picked Toto, a friend of his was playing a tour in Japan, and he took a picture of the toilet because in in Japan, Toto means toilet. He sent them the picture and said, "Yeah, great name, guys." You know, but they were stuck with it by that time. So, but they were really good. They they're an interesting band. You know, they uh, I don't know. They sound good. The session musicians made good, I guess. Okay, so uh, last one, last drummer. Who do you think? Uh, your opinion, please. Brian Dunn. What would you give him? Uh, I gotta leave that for somebody else. Okay, I, I got a lot. I need to get a lot better. <laughs> you, how long have you been playing, Brian? I need to get a lot better. How long have you been playing? I mean, um, since I don't really even know when I started, but I was very young, mm -hmm. very very young. You know, okay. probably six years old or something. Now, how I'm old? not even sure. There's always been drums in the house, so yeah. How old are you now? You look like you're about thirty-five. I'm gonna guess. I'm, I'm 50. Are you really? <laughs> uh, no, you're not. Get out of town. Yeah, I was born in October 1st, 1970. Yeah. 50 is the new first. 35. 50 is the new 35, yeah. <laughs> wow. You don't. You look pretty good for 50 there, dog. Holy you cow. Libra? Interesting. A look yes. at, oh, Raven. Yes. Uh-oh. You're a Libra. Raven knows. Okay. All right. So, um... <laughs> <laughs> so so listen let's just go back to the show for a second so how, how many how many shows do you record in a given year this is the daryl's um house. yeah it kind of changes in the when i first joined the band they were we were doing one a month okay and then then they got a different tv deal and it became uh eight in a season mm -hmm. so it would be basically eight over the course of a year mm -hmm. um Sometimes we, we, you know, we would go six months doing nothing, and then we would do, you know, five of them in five weeks. Yeah, it all right. depends on wow. how the scheduling works out. Mm. That's it, a lot. <laughs> now, um, yeah, but I gotta say just quickly that when we do the music, we go to do it. We meet the like Tommy. We met Tommy for the first time at one o'clock. By three thirty, we were done. Really? Yeah, yeah. Tommy. The Shaw, rest yeah. of the day is spent on just interviews and eating. My favorite part, mm -hmm. and, and uh, yeah, just hanging out. That's another. That's another so cool it's thing. It's a whole day and night event, but the music is very short. Right. The, the, that's a whole another cool thing about the Daryl Daryl's House show is that there's a cooking segment. A lot of times there's a cooking segment, and it's always this kind of like odd food. And when Smokey Robinson was in there, they yeah. brought in all this kind of Middle Eastern food, and we're sitting at home watching, and say, "Man, I want some of that." So, <laughs> exactly. You know, it looks so good. Oh man. yeah, it's always good. It's always so good. Mm -hmm. I get in trouble by my wife because people are usually talking at the dinner table, and I'm usually the one that's just. <laughs> so um another thing too is uh if if you want to really go out and see this uh, the hollow notes band in, in my opinion really a good night was um it's hollow notes live in dublin all right you must have done that probably four or five years ago maybe that's a terrific show yeah. man that thing really is that was an awesome night that's the best crowd I've, that's the best audience 
any of us, you ask anybody in the band, it's the best audience we've ever been in front of. Wow. The Irish audience? It was yeah. incredible. Yeah, they're all, they were louder than the band. Well, they're they were all, literally louder than the band. <laughs> they were all drunk, that's why. <laughs> no, I, I will cut that out. But, 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 yeah. but what was good about it was that you know you you guys you played all the hits but you, you rearranged some of them and there was some like guitar duos between uh, Shane and and John Oates who was a really good guitar player that's another surprise John Oates is a really a good guitar yeah. player you know i mean you never really think of him that yep. way but and and he was doing so you know he would he would do like this back and forth with the sax player and stuff and the vocals that's another thing that you the vocals in that band the just the harmonies are just really really super oh yeah we have we have four. We have four lead singers in the band. Yeah, it's crazy. Wow. Okay. It's crazy. Yeah, they're all really good singers. So except hey, for me. <laughs> we're talking to Brian Dunn, who is the uh, drummer of uh, for Dal uh, Hall and Oates Band and also the Daryl's House Band. So does everyone get along? I mean, musicians always get along, right? There's never any dust ups. Actually, uh, yeah. Actually, <laughs> no. But in the art case, yeah, we really get along. I mean, we go out on the road and. By far, any other situation I've been in, this is the easiest situation socially. Mm -hmm. Even the crew, we all like. There are there are there are times you go on the road, and depending on who you're with, you'll have your little group of people that you're going to text if you're going to go have breakfast, or you're going to go have lunch. Mm -hmm. With us, it's like 19 people on my text feed. Really? Everybody's welcome every second of the day. Mm -hmm. No one's trying to get away from anybody. It's pretty amazing. Oh, that yeah, is good. so great. And the show seems like yeah. that. It seems like everybody's really getting along. Yeah, and really having fun. Yeah. yeah, and really loving music and making music together. Yeah. So uh, It really is. What about the groupies? What, the um, groupies a problem? You have to... <laughs> <laughs> uh oh, <laughs> no, we're boring. <laughs> we're boring. You can tell us. It's okay. You don't have good, any groupies. Answer, Seriously, <laughs> he's no not going to tell I, I, you. No comment. No comment. Oh. Yes. <laughs> there we go. There's the, the bumper. <laughs> wow. Okay. So, so we go out on the road, and we on our night off, we go and try to find the nearest Indian restaurant. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Okay. What to uh, to eat curry? Curry. Yep. That's a, that's Pretty like a, good, man. That's like yeah. eating dirt. Now wait a minute. Hold it with the curry. I, I had a I had a curry at Bristol Studios once. It's like eating dirt. Or was it just I got a bad? <laughs> curry? Didn't, I bad. didn't have good curry then. Oh, yeah. yeah, there you go. A <laughs> dirty curry. That's a thing. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Wow. Hey, listen, Dr. Bob. Uh, now you were in the business a while sure. ago. Now, and uh, not a while ago, you're still in. But uh, you played with guys who played in Donnie Iris's band, right, back in Chicago. Yes, uh, members of, the, I think it was the Jaggers, used to rehearse with the vocalists with the band I was with, which is called the Sixth and Atlantic Band, band out of Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. so, so one time you were in a rock band, a fusion band, a classical orchestra, and uh, what, you were a solo act? Yes, and uh, electronic musician, and did uh, concerts that were... Uh, had multimedia as well as multi-sensory concerts. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, it must have been fun back then, late 60s, early 70s, making money. Yes. <laughs> His acid count is multi. Uh, <laughs> yes. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. no. Oh, okay. Yeah, one of the questions... What did I remember? One of the questions we didn't ask is, uh, what do you call a musician without a girlfriend? Homeless. Homeless, right. Oh, wow. Right. He's six for 11. Oh my, you are so good at that. Oh. <laughs> I can't believe this. Okay. So, Brian, what, what's, what's, in the, what's in the future? What, I know at one point you said, uh, you, don't you have a, a degree in music teaching, a music teaching degree or something? Ed, music ed, education. I've, yes, I have, I have a music ed degree to teach K through 12 instrumental bands, but I never wow. used it. Really? I yeah. never used it. Um, but, I mean, for me now, I... I uh, I record drum. I've been doing it for 17 years now, doing remote sessions. It's not kind of, it's nothing kind of new now. A lot of people doing it, mm -hmm. but I've been consistently doing it for 17 years now. Mm -hmm. People sending me tracks and and uh, recording in my stu my home studio and sending them back out. So that's been good. And since the, ironically, I've never been so busy with it. Interesting. Like it went up 80 percent. Yeah, like people are at home. Incredibly. Lucky at this point, yeah. It turned out to be a great thing so, in terms of that business, anyway. So, where is home for you now? Are you on still on Long Island, or have you? 
Yeah, Suff- Suffolk County, Long Island, Rock uh-huh. Conkoma, and uh, yeah. Okay, great. And and how how is it? I mean, you have a family of a son. I mean, what's it like uh, on when you're on the road? Where are they? Yeah, it's difficult, man. It's they're they're home, um, but the, uh, you know, I travel less now than I did when you know. Let's wow! I'm, I'm my wife and I are together for twenty one years now. So, so you know. I was actually touring more then than I am now, although mm-hmm. I wasn't playing in a band as large as Hall and Oates. But l- luckily for me, the way they work it, we it's rare. Like we just did five weeks. That's even rare. Mm-hmm. We usually we'll do three weeks away mm-hmm. and then I'll be home for five or six weeks and then we'll go away for a week and then I'll be home for five weeks. Like I, I'm really only away less than a third of the year. Yeah, right. It's okay. all said and done. And, uh, so it's actually for a touring musician, it's a pretty light load. Mm-hmm. And, so yeah, it works out. It works out. And when I'm home, I treat. I treat. Uh, I get home. I hit the ground running. I'm. I'm. I. I. I, I play. I like playing in clubs anyway. But mm-hmm. I was going to say I play in clubs for very little bit of money. But, but I, I just need to be playing music, and I need to treat this gig like it's going to end tomorrow. Because mm. what happens is it's easy to have a gig like this and get and expect that it's just going to be there. Yep. I make believe that I'm I'm about to lose it. So I'm oh. always my, I'm on people's mind. In the New York area, I make sure that people know that I'm around and, mm-hmm. and I want to play. Yeah, right. So you know, Daryl Daryl's going to be Daryl and John. You know, Daryl's going to be seventy five. Seventy five. Yeah. Yeah. Seventy five. No. Yeah. Yeah. He was, yeah. He was John. He's born in nineteen forty seven, and I think John was born in nineteen forty five or forty. Uh, my God, my, my brain 48, is... 48, 49. Wow, wait. Yeah, That's like, John, I think, yeah, it's, I think John's going to turn 73 and Daryl's going to turn 75. It's crazy. And now, the reality, as long as he can, as long as he can walk, he's going to do this. Right. He just needs to do it. <laughs> right. So, lucky, I'm very lucky. But you never know. You never know when they, you know, they're, they're not doing it, not that they don't like to make money, but they don't really have to do this. They're doing it because they love it. So, yeah, sure. Um when they decide to call it quits, I can't. I can't count on you know, just being able to make a living. So I, I, I mean, I am counting on that I can make a living, mm-hmm. but I'm, I'm not kind of resting on my laurels. I'm making sure that I, I'm busy all the time. Well, like I said, you're you're ahead of everyone else. Point. You're ahead of everyone else. Yeah, I'm trying to be. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to be. Yeah. So uh, are, there, are there any plans for any new, uh, new songs? New releases? Well, you know what? For many years, they decided they weren't going to be writing together anymore. And then just right before the we we went to the North Sea Jazz Festival and Daryl met a young producer that was sort of enamored by him. He loved him. He was a big fan. And he Daryl took the time to listen to this guy's stuff. And he was like, whoa, this guy's great. And it turned into the possibility of John and Daryl and this guy working all together. Mm-hmm. making some new music and then the pandemic hit mm-hmm. so yeah. it's still it's, it's up in the air at this point right but i daryl's still doing his own solo stuff and john is always doing his own solo stuff as well yeah mm-hmm. um i read um john's uh book change of seasons right in fact uh Lois bought it for me. She thought she was buying me a Daryl Hall book, but she actually bought me a John Oates book. You know, <laughs> so and I wound up reading, reading him. Man, what a what an interesting life that guy has had. You know, he he grew oh, up. Oh my god, he's he awesome in New York City. In this, you know, like his family had come over from Italy, and like his whole immediate family lived in this like one block in New York City. It's like you think it's going to be this is the story, and then when he's like eight, eight years old, the family moves to Amish country. All of a sudden, he's out in the middle of yeah. nowhere. And he just taught himself yeah. music and stuff, and he's he's he, he's an interesting guy because he's he 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 drives himself. And even at one point when Hall and Oates was like at the pinnacle of the MTV years, he he went to someone some famous musician teacher to learn stuff. You know, he was at the top of his game, but he wanted to learn more. Interesting guy, yeah. interesting life. He's 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 incredible. He's like a Renaissance man. He had, yes. he's interested in a lot of different things. Yep, and. Everything he he's interested in, he really dives in all the That's way. That's it, right? And he's yes. still like, he's still in his in his dressing room. He's practicing guitar. He's constantly trying to get better. Charlie Deschamps, the other one that's like that. I have to say, Sex I have player. to mention him because we're all we're all super inspired by him because Charlie is probably uh, he's got to be like seventy eight or something. Really? Huh? And this guy is still 
practicing. I hear him like we're at hotels. He's practicing <laughs> every day. Wow. He's the he's the first guy when we get to a new city to get up in the morning and go to a museum or wow. experience the city. And he's also he's also uh, the first guy to be interested to listen to some new young band. Mm. Like he's he's all that. It's awesome to see someone of that age that's wow. still like that. So yeah. it's pretty 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 yeah, incredible. Right. Well, listen, before we wrap this up, I just got to ask you one more question because I watched, um, you know, Daryl's uh, show on when he put the house back together, when he redid his house in Connecticut. I, yeah. think, I think it wasn't Daryl's house. It was like, you know, some renovation project or something like that. Daryl Hall's overhaul. Oh, right, yes, right. Yes. And I'll tell you, that's, I watched it. I binged it one day, watched like all eight episodes at once. And I'm telling you, that's a funny, you could put a laugh track on that thing because the stuff that he runs into, you know, the, it's this beautiful house. It's in Connecticut, but it's in a Tony pot of Connecticut and they have all these kind of rules. And so I guess they're putting the septic system in and then oh, it's almost done. And some inspector comes up and says, oh, you're, you're too close to the road. You have to put it down there. So they have to put it down there, and they found, like, the only piece of granite within 50 miles. They had to, like, you know, dig into the granite to put the septic system in. But but he, but he, it was it impressed me because he knew all this stuff. He knows the difference between this door and this window. And, you know, I mean, he really knew his oh, stuff, yeah. you know? He's another one, man. He's another, They're both, like, Renaissance men. It's pretty incredible. They're, like, they're constantly reading. He's And he's always been into old, old uh houses and, and i don't know if he's been into carpentry but he understands how stuff is made mm -hmm. so he, yeah it's it's uh and they're but they're history buffs too these guys read constantly wow so it's, no it's one, pretty cool no wonder there's no groupies they're all eggheads lois <laughs> <laughs> well listen hey brian look at thanks very much for joining us we really appreciate it. we had a good time can't believe you got six out of 11 questions on the musician's <laughs> IQ quiz. We're going to have to come up with different questions. A record. You know, please. We have to give him, please, let's give him a real round of applause, and we will sweeten it up in post. All right, Brian, next time you're around, we're all going to go see you, okay? Great. Okay. Yeah. Thanks very much. We really appreciate it. Brian Dunn of the Hall and Oaks. It's real pleasure. Yeah, real pleasure. Oh, my gosh. This is so cool. Right, yeah, so why don't we do cool. this? Thank you. Thank you. Let's take a commercial break now, and we'll be right back. You're listening to Mac Maloney's Musical Exiles show here on the Distant Thunder Radio Network. It's early medieval Europe. Norse marauders are pouring down from the north. Step riders threaten from the east, and Moorish raiders are surging up from the south. Now, as the Vikings plan an invasion of Ireland, the country's aging king must somehow protect his nation. But who is up to the task? Nordic sagas tell us an obscure and unlikely hero arises to save his people. Wolf of Clontarf leaps into history as a nightmare to the Norse and avenger for the Celts. It's Vikings meets Braveheart as this legendary Irish warrior, some medieval special operations forces, and a young woman spy help the Irish king defeat the Viking invaders. It's a tale spanning 15 years and leading up to the most decisive battle of the Middle Ages. That's Wolf of Clontarf, a new novel from Thomas J. Howley, now on Amazon. And I just kept going on and on about myself. I'm taking a leak in the driveway. He says, I know you like to talk to total stranger. The story's got nothing to do with the Bruins game. It's what happened with Grandma. I was wondering if those were sadomasochism straps or something. <laughs> but I digress uh, from what I don't know. Get into the beautiful mind of Juan Juan only on the Mac Maloney Military X-Files show. Everyone to Mac Maloney's Musical X Files show here on the Distant Thunder Radio Network. This is Mac Maloney. Well, the show we uh, managed to put together here tonight. Now, you just uh, very quickly introduce the gang, okay? The gang. Um, the regular gang isn't here, but with us is um, a good friend, a good witch up there in upstate New York. Raven is here. Hello. Thanks mm -hmm. for having me. Okay. 
Well, it's you and me, kid, right? Of the, uh, uh, yeah. Of the yeah, Beatles? It's just yeah. us, man. Okay. <laughs> Um, also, uh, with this is a good friend. Uh, hang on there, Chuck. No, <laughs> um, our good friend Chris Billius at uh, from Bristol Studios in Boston, producer, engineer. Hey, how are we doing? Some big shoes to fill tonight. Award winning. Should I? We should do a segment on your award some night. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Anyway, yeah. yeah, read it in the biography. Um, also, Dr. Bob Gross out there in Chicago. UFO researcher sac- slash saxophone player. How you doing, Dr. Bob? Good. How are you? Thank you. Okay. How's that um, prescription for medical marijuana? How's that going for me and one more? Uh, still working on okay, that. Thank you. It's okay. legal huh. here, you know. <laughs> Lois didn't hear that. Good. So um, <laughs> anyway, and did miss it. Yes. <laughs> our special guest in Lois Lane is with us tonight. A very rare appearance in the studio. Hi, everybody. It's good to be here. Um. A special guest down south somewhere, Jocko Johnson, Jocko, Officer Jocko. Put the drag that music in here, right here. Thank you, for Happy to join the roll call. Okay. Where's your microphone there? Where's your mic? Yeah, I might fake it. Yeah, okay. Speak right into the speak right into the mic. Yeah, okay. All right. Chris, you want to do that again, or do we have to get clearance for that? Uh, no, I don't know how it goes, actually. <laughs> okay. There you go. That's an actual smart. I was going to say, I think let's get smart. There you go. Chaka, this is your theme song. Oh, good. That was good. That was from Control. That's so smart, right? Yeah, that was. That was. Wow, all right. That's awesome. Chief in age of 99. See, you oh, won't yeah. have to fix that in post. There you go, Just right. It's already have fixed. Crispy part of it all the there time. There you go. All right. <laughs> so, oh, no, anyway. We'll pay royalties. Oh, shit. Earlier. <laughs> I'm sorry. Cut it out. Earlier in the uh, show, we talked uh, to Dr. Bob. He was involved in a classified project to actually make CD music that is recorded to a CD sound dirtier, sound a little grittier, right, Dr. Bob? The elevator pitch? Yes. Okay, wow, that's that's one to the second floor. Okay, so is that, is that dithering, Bob? I it wasn't referred to as dithering. They were just uh, you know would, would just dirty it up mm-hmm. to, to make it sound natural to the human brain. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. But you see, these days, these days, and and I know this from uh, you know being in Chris's studio is that you can do anything. You know, you can do anything, anything at all. Would you say, Chris, to make any sound, to 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 duplicate any sound, to make new sounds and stuff like that? It's it's unlimited. It's almost there's almost it, too it much really is. to pick yeah. from. And and they were using sounds back then to cause other effects as well, physical effects to human beings. Really? Yeah. Tell us more. Um, uh, they to. To work with me, they brought in, uh, his name was Dr. Sargent, and I think he was from the United Kingdom. Okay. And he was in a realm called psychoacoustics, hmm. which meant the uh, the effect that sounds can have on your brain. Uh-oh. Yes. And he was working on a project in France that he said where they were uh, having a problem with riot control. Okay, good. Yep. Yeah. So they were working on a device that when you turned it on, it was, what, it was a type of generator okay. and would come to a frequency that would cause the people that were rioting, would cause their bladder to open. Well, wait a minute. What? Hang on. Hold on a second. Now, wait. So, <laughs> For real? And yeah. What? And <laughs> so they have, you had the large That's crowd. a pretty <laughs> thing to do. Oh, oh they, no, that, see, that's uh, oh, 1850 and oh, edit that. Was, that was part two of wow. it. Wow. But, uh, when, uh, oh, they did a brown note? Uh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, my goodness. No. But I, I thought the they were just going to play some be, uh, French rock and roll. Yeah, go ahead. would wet themselves, and they wouldn't feel like uh, rioting anymore. Mm-hmm. But the only problem is the person running the device also wet himself. Oh. Wow, himself, I see. Okay, collateral damage. Stop running the device. Yep, okay. Hey, listen, I say if you wet myself, I think I'd just keep on going. Tell you the truth, at that point, if everyone else, <laughs> you know, you're yeah. part of a gang, I mean, right? like, what, what more do you have? There's nothing. Yeah, know. right. Why not go for it at that point, right? Fighting the good fight. Right. <laughs> exactly. No, we had spoke about that, you know, in the police department. I don't think New York ever went to use it. 
Really? But yeah. the military used that for psyops and stuff. Yeah, they have right. a. Um, didn't they not, Didn't they use that? And you know, with Noriega, they started it. Yeah, they have. Well, yeah, they have a whole. And then they and then they got those sounds and stuff that really make people you know cringe. They had a whole like, like thing where they would. Uh, were high frequency sounds that you don't really hear. Yeah. Right. But they bother you. Yeah, dr- right. yeah that's wild, man. They're above the range of hearing. It's like that Havana syndrome thing. Yeah, that's yeah. what they think is going on. Yeah, they. Accordions. Bombardi, or according to thought banjos, as it turns out. Listen. Banjos! Yeah. Earlier tonight, we had uh, Brian Dunn. I can name drop now. Brian Dunn of the Holland Oats Band, drummer, great drummer, also of the house band of uh, Darrow's House, uh, which I recommend highly. Um, and we, uh, every time there's a musical guest on, we give them the 10 questions, the music IQ quiz, and they never know any of them. And he got six out of 10 of them. What's going on? We, we got to do better. <laughs> okay, do better well, thank you, Raven, for that uh, you know sign of support. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so anyway, yeah, well, yeah, we have to come up with better questions. You're right. Okay, so Jocko, let's go back to you. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Do you ever play a musical instrument? You you look like a piano you player know, to me. I, I tried, believe it or not. Okay. I started to, and we just didn't have the money for the lessons because then I'd have to buy my own piano. Piano, yes, yeah, hard to lug around. Yep. Okay. And uh, yeah, really. And I and I, I tried it the guitar, but never got too far. Yeah, it's, guitar's a hard thing to learn how to play. I think guitars. I think guitar, in a way, you have to. I've tried to do it many times, and I never. It never works. I'm just you know some people are guitar players, some people aren't. I just don't know how to do yeah. it, you know. But then there were other people who just pick up a guitar and they're playing you know flamingo stuff in like thirty yeah. seconds, you know. It's just yeah. One of, one of my sons was in the college band and he played you know the orchestra, and uh, he uh, he could play any horn pretty much. It was mm-hmm. amazing. You just pick up wow. a brass horn and right to it. Yeah, we've talked about this before. You know whether someone's musical talent is in their DNA or is in something that we don't understand. And I think the way that we kind of prove it is that you see these kids from Japan, three years old, four years mm-hmm. old, playing, you know, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, you know, perfectly for three hours. There's no way that that person has been on earth long enough to get the accumulated knowledge to do something like that. It has to come from somewhere else. Dr. Bob, you're, you're a doctor. What do you say to that? Yes. Yes. Well, there's been some studies done on, for example, like you've heard of perfect pitch. I think it was when one of your questions earlier. Yes. Yes. When a banjo hits but, uh, an accordion in a dumpster. Right. Yes. Go ahead. I'm sorry. But, but uh, if certain people, their brains are designed certain ways that if you have, for example, with perfect pitch, if you have experience like with a piano, and it has to be before the age of seven, mm-hmm. you can actually train your brain to identify certain pitches and essentially memorize them but it has to be at a certain uh age mm-hmm. why, why is so it there are things like that under seven wow. did you say under seven years old yes at the, the research back when i was looking at it it had to be under the age seven uh when you started actually working with that and, and uh what what's what what happens at seven does our brain change or something well, I think a lot of people feel that, yes, a lot of things start to be established by that time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But well, there this... are... You, oh, you, go ahead, Dr. Bob. I, I said you, there is you know, when, something called neuroplasticity mm-hmm. where you can actually change your brain. You can cause it to grow neurons where right. it actually changes. Mm-hmm. So you can, they're starting to do some experimenting with that. No matter what your age? Yes. Yes. Wow. Okay. Okay. That's, yeah. It's, sounds good. Is it is it going to involve work? Will it be work involved? Yes. Oh, well, then okay. <laughs> I'm sure. Let me know what happens. <laughs> okay. So, anyway, yeah, it's a pretty interesting field. Uh, when you, you get into it in a lot of areas where you you actually start growing new brain cells. Wow. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well. Yeah, at any age. And it really, yeah. And it's really a matter of your mindset that yes. makes that happen and when, the work you're willing to put into it. I see. So but it, that comes along with your interest. So in other words, it's a lot yes. of work and you have to have like an optimistic outlook on life? Or a willingness to work at <laughs> okay, it. Okay, yes. all right. Well, tell me how it is. Okay. Enough. I've killed <laughs> enough brain cells. That might be a soft pass <laughs> from Mac. So anyway, <clears throat> so listen. Uh, so we talked on this show about uh, six months ago about this 
Rock and roll murder mystery. Okay, there was a guy named Bobby Fuller, and he was the head, uh, the, the lead guy, lead guitar player, lead singer, in a band called the Bobby Fuller Four. They came from Texas. They kind of had some regional hits. They were like a rock and roll band. They weren't like a British invasion band. They were just like an American rock and roll band, though. And they had a uh, they moved to uh, L.A. and <clears throat> had a number one hit called "I Fought the Law and the Law Won." I mean, everyone has heard that song. Okay, and that was about it. But on the day of very close to when it hit number one across the country, he was found in his in his car in the parking garage of his mother's apartment building, and he had ingested um, five gallons of gasoline. Somehow, some way, five gallons of gasoline went down his throat and into his stomach, and that's what di- mm-hmm. that's what killed him, obviously. And then there was gasoline all over the car, and it was never um, solved. I don't think the L.A. cops really put a whole lot of brain power into it. And the other guys in the band, they just said, you know, there's something bad going on here. And they like left for Texas and never hear from them again. So we talked about it, and there's a lot of just interesting stuff having to do with it, including the bizarre way that he died. And Jocko Johnson, because he, NYPD, 10 years doing all this kind of stuff, you think you've cracked the case there, J.J. too? Well, um you know, it's it's tough, like I was telling you in the beginning, Mac, when you don't have the actual reports and can't go back and interview or at least read those things. Yes. Or the notes and stuff. But what I could get online, there seems to be a number of theories. And the one that kind of sticks out for me that seems the most, I mean, the, he was he was looking to start expanding with uh, acid, they said. Um, he was making in 1966 before he died. Yep. The money they made, he was, he had about five million dollars in wealth. Did he really so, from that? From and that, that one was hit? today's. To imagine that's today's dollars. That's forty two million one hundred and thirty thousand ninety two dollars and fifty nine cents. From that so, one hit, man, he made. Well, five? he had a couple other hits. Did actually. he really? Yeah, but still, that's the only I one. I have he's... the names of them. I have the names of them somehow I've come across it, but I mean that's that's uh, what he's known for. Let's put it that way, right? But yeah, and I was surprised to find out that he actually had a couple others that were in the top ten, hmm. and that's when they left Texas and moved out to Florida, uh, California. Oh, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And he hooked up with this girl, okay, who was like one of these, uh, you know, these figures that uh, like the Kennedy uh, girlfriend, you know, uh, 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 that uh, uh, they said uh, uh, how. This was this, this, I'm not, you know, it's just what I'm saying. The Kennedy girlfriend, man. And, that's that's uh, you know where the mobs, the mobs. You shouldn't have a wide there, field uh, there, my friend. Name, uh, <laughs> gotta yeah. remember her name. Yeah, I okay. got it somewhere. Go ahead. But it's been a while since I went to Edna. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's, All she right. Was one of the, anyway, um, and he was dating her. Yes. Now his um, agent was this real dirtbag kind of guy. No, an agent Everybody in a dirtbag. What as, happened? You know, he, yeah. he, as soon as he signs a contract and the kid starts making money, this guy, uh, I think his name was Bob Keen. Mm-hmm. He decides that he's going to be his producer, his director, and his agent and his manager. Sounds like Chris Billions. All at once. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, he's like, <laughs> I'm your guy now, you know? Yep. And uh, he is supposedly in debt to the mob. Wow. He's in cahoots with the mob. You know, in those days, they're saying in Hollywood, this was the way yes. it was. Yes. You know, in the 60s and 70s, the LAPD had a unit that was this some sort of special operations unit, they called them. They worked directly for the chief. And these guys, like, Robert Kennedy would come to town. There's a story. A guy wrote a book who was in this squad, and he talks about how, you know, he, I don't even want to mention these things. You know, it's like, this is what he said in the book, how he got death confessions from Peter Lawford about Mm -hmm. who killed Marilyn Monroe and the whole thing. And these guys would come swooping in on one phone call from the chief. Everything would disappear. No files would be Nothing yep. would go on paper. Everything was squished. Nobody knew nothing. Yes, yes. Now, that's that's pretty nuts, okay? Mm-hmm. So, you know, they had this theory, which is why, when you remember how uh, Raven was saying, how, you know, when they went to the when they went to the scene, it was in a parking lot outside. Mm-hmm. The cops didn't even set up a crime scene with no tape or nothing. Wow, huh? They sent everybody away. They were throwing people out of the scene. They have witnesses. Yeah, I have, you know, um, uh, 
statements from the witnesses where they said, you know, we were uh, we were out there and people said, hey, get away from this. You know, we don't want nothing to do with you. And hmm. Get away. Get out of the scene. One of the witnesses saw the cop take the gasoline can that was in the car, takes it and throws it in a garbage can. Uh -huh. and just, like, Wouldn't that be evidence Forget if the guy yeah, drank five gallons of gasoline? But this, uh, right. But this Bob Keen from uh, Delphi Records, oh. they said. I uh, hope he's dead. Go ahead. Yeah, he is. Oh, well. He is. He is. Well, now, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But apparently, I don't know if he introduced her, but there was this girlfriend who was this mobbed up guy's girlfriend. Why does this, why do we hear this she's story? Dead and everybody's dead. Yep. Why do we hear this story? It's in every mob book, every mob movie where some guy falls in love with some mob guy's wife or girlfriend. Who in their right yes. mind would she carry on an affair them. with the with the with the with the goomba of the uh Yeah, the uh, of the Godfather. That's just insane. Right. And and she kind of chased him and the thing they said was oh, that well, you know, he didn't even realize it because he was such a you know, like a hillbilly kind of kid. Go ahead. And he just comes out at uh, L.A. and he's making all this money. Yep. And he really is not even sure about what it is that's going on yet. So they have these theories. And here's what they say. Okay. You know, and the, and the autopsy comes up with this thing where it's asphyxiation. So he's smothered. He didn't get air into his lungs. Mm. But his, his bronchial tubes and his lungs show no edema at all. What's that so, mean? What's that mean, Doc? <laughs> Swollen, you know, okay. it's got to be. So, if you suffocate yep. or if you're a junkie, yep. you got huge lungs. Oh, I swell. I remember Dr. Biden was telling me how, you know, like heroin addicts would come in and these guys would overdose and how much bigger their lungs would be and how much fluid would have to hold them. Really? Yeah. You know, huh. Because of what, you know, the narcotics and everything. Okay, go ahead. And this was a common cause of death. They would suffocate. Okay. That's why when they give them Narcan, it brings them back and they, they breathe because it kills the opiates, which stop mm -hmm. them from breathing. Oh, okay. So you don't get that. And it slows your heart down as well. So you don't get all that. The blood, your heart don't pump that fluid out. Okay. You know, it's like a guy with a bad heart. He's got to take water pills, right? Okay. okay if so you say so. All they right. say the, the, <laughs> the, the theories are that there was a rival. Professional jealousy to the point of homicide has been suggested as a motive. Really? But it's hard to imagine any were really mm. considering this guy enough for threat to kill him. Because they were like a two, three hit one. That, you know, you make good money, but. Yeah. Well, if he's if he was fooling around with some mob guy's girlfriend or wife, then you know this is usually how you end up. But drinking the gasoline, I mean, that's I've never heard of that before. Have you, dear Jocko? Drinking no, gasoline. But what happened was the mob, according to what it was supposed to be, hires this nitwit from out of town. Okay. And they don't want to really kill the guy. Okay. Because the they're hooked up with the manager. Yep. And they need this kid. Yeah. He's a, he's a gold mine. Yep. So they say, because he's getting ready to go on these big tours and he's already touring locally. Okay. And they're telling him, look, don't kill the guy. Don't Just kill him. Send him a message. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the guy him. was not very experienced. No. And the message yeah. didn't really, yeah, he just got like, they don't know if the guy was nuts or what, because I think I read somewhere where they found the guy in a, like from Detroit in a trunk somewhere in California at one point. They smelled like well, gasoline. Somewhere, they? somewhere. They okay. think that this was the guy who screwed up. All right. The, okay. Yeah. The message, you know? Hmm. Hmm. And that's uh... why I look at it. And I think that that's about the closest. Now, if you read the brother, Bobby. Yep. I'm sorry. His, what's his brother's name? I think. Uh, Teddy. I get his name. Yeah. Was it Hill? Teddy. 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 Teddy Fuller. His brother wrote a book. Okay. Yeah, his brother wrote a book. Oh, boy. His brother was in the band. Randy. Randy. Brother was in the band with him. I think he was the bass guitar. Okay. Uh oh. And Randy believes this is the cause. Okay. okay. So he's 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 hanging with the mob who modded it. And so there's, there's two versions of this. One says that Bobby was getting ready to ditch his contract, and that certain unsavory music industry types were unhappy about it. The others involved Judy Exner like figure. That was the girl. Oh. Judith X like it's figure. That JFK's was girlfriend. girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Right. Reputedly, the girlfriend of a club owner linked to organized crime. <laughs> what? And this, you know, Mario Cuomo said, wait a minute, there is no such thing as the mafia. He's and the I one who said that? Thing out and I put it in my wallet when I was on the Okay. Job. And we're going to disagree hey, with him? It says so. Okay. Go ahead. But that was the deal where they said that, you know, he didn't care for it. 
because he was going out with his girlfriend. Well, that's and just a. You uh, don't want to kill the guy because they're going to lose all this money they had, you know, in him. Yeah, yeah but. Uh, and they didn't know if they could get the insurance on him, and it wasn't as much as what the kid was doing. Right. So they tried to do it, and it went wrong. And right. the kid was in the car. Yep. The guy locked him in. He beats him up, tunes him up. Tunes he's him up. knocked out. The fumes come out of the car because it's like 110 degrees. Oh, man. Outside. The car's like, you know, 140 or something. And he suffocates. Oh. Wow. Oh, that's awesome. So they, they yeah. have this thing, like, you know, they have the report where the family, you know, goes to the autopsy, goes to the medical examiner, and they keep changing it from suicide to accidental to possible homicide, mm -hmm. back to accidental. One time they, they checked all three boxes. Yeah, yeah. You can't um, do that. It's got to be a yeah, cause that's, and a that's manner. That's wild. You know? There's no you way that that's... A manner and a cause of death. You can't, above, right, yeah. Doc? You can't do that. You're right. So, I mean, that, that's... I know technically a medical examiner is allowed to change the cause of death. Yes, but he But, I mean, you three. can't choose all three. Right. Yeah. That's <laughs> insane. Take your pick. So, you know, right. You know, it's like a weather from column A, hmm. one from column B. But <laughs> the family is still trying, they said, to go out and exhume this body for wow. further, you know, oh. more scientific testing which you know if people were hmm. embalmed properly you could you know i know dr Biden has exhumed bodies 100 years old and told you what happened mm -hmm. to them okay and this dr know, bob or another dr bob cheryl weck and all of these fellows. yeah 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 who would do that man that's a really no. bad it's a really bad job Biden, the, uh, Biden's done like 20 30 thousand <clears> autopsies or something all right. his whole time. he's in his 80s now <laughs> That's a I mean, weird way so, to make a living. I, yeah, doing. I try to call him today. I try to contact him. Mm -hmm. I know he's getting up there in years. You know, he used yep. to just pick up the phone, but he didn't answer. So I didn't want to, you know, aggravate him. I don't yeah. know what he's doing. I know his wife wasn't too well a few years back. Okay. She recovered. But, you know, he's getting old. I don't see him on the news anymore. Oh. So maybe I'll, he's I'll probably hear from him eventually. He still might around. be pulling a pot about it. You don't know, right? Oh, I'm sure he does. does he, yeah. he testifies okay. all the time. Mm -hmm. and he's always on. He used to be on Fox News, like, you know, all the time. Oh, well, then he must be very good then. Hmm. Raven, I you mean, must have was, something. You know, he was their guy, so he did that. I'll tell you what about Dr. Michael Bond. Okay. He will not lie to you, and he's never going to tell anybody what they want to hear. He'll only tell you the truth. <laughs> That's he's okay. Gone and, and he's done autopsies for people, for families, and they told him, we don't want to hear your testimony. Would he be on this show? Would he come on our show? Uh, you know what? I know he's getting up there in years, but I'll ask him. Well, tell him what's Larry I mean, King. That would be an excellent score if you could, because he is, in my opinion, in many, many offices and departments okay. and courts and judges and scientists, the number one autopsy, the one, the number one pathologist in the world. All right, let me, I, I have to uh, throw this to Raven because she's raising her hand. So you would, uh, I'm, I'm assuming you would like to see an autopsy at some point uh, if you haven't already seen one. A second. Oh, you I mean you never saw an autopsy? No, I'm talking about I've Raven. never I seen can, one. I, I actually tell you a great had, story about Hang on. Yeah. I, I had like a brief period of time where I was like, I need to go back to school and become an autopsy technician. And then I was like, yeah, who can afford that? Not me. <laughs> but <laughs> that was the reason I, you didn't do it. <laughs> okay, good reason. I, I would just, I would love to be a part of that. But really? I was thinking. No, you know. So, an autopsy-tician? <laughs> So, yeah. All right, go ahead. Go well, ahead, you really, please. You really, don't, you really don't want it, Rick. <clears throat> no, let her go on. Go ahead, please. I want to hear this. We'll make a bumper out of this. Go ahead. So, I, I know this will be a bummer, but I was no, thinking a bumper. A the bumper. Same. Same thing. Oh, a bump like a. Yes. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I was thinking because <laughs> wow, same good thing we're not a TV show. Uh, not interviewed. Yep. Um, investigated Bobby Fuller's death. Also investigated. Um, Elizabeth Small. Elizabeth Small. Oh, uh, Black Dahlia. It's Elizabeth oh, Small, I, right? Yeah, who's no, who's she? I don't know. Her name. Elizabeth oh, Small. God, I can't yeah, think of her. It, but Elizabeth it something. The, it was a little earlier, but it's it okay. was earlier. No, but no, it's no. like, no. so the LAPD mm. investigated this and had. I mean, I feel well, like well, we all know, know about, who you know did it. So black, it's you like. Know about the Black Dahlia. Her, who did it? Who did it? The alleged killer's father. Yeah. The son is a cop in LA. And, and I feel like we, we know who did and that. Yeah, does, How do we not? Like, I feel like we know who killed Bobby Fuller, but like, you know, oh, quotations, that, quotations, you know, we, we know, but right. that's right. like what's going on in my brain is like, 
come on. Like, we can do mom. better. We can we like, can do this. Mm-hmm. Right. But like the Black Dahlia and like Bobby uh, Fuller, all these people are dead now. So who do you prosecute? I know. Yeah. I know. The only thing you have it's, is to you know, exhume them. Hey, it's just such a shame. Because ever hear the, you still uh, can't prosecute uh, anybody. It's just for the family, really. Yeah. And then they What's have to do it. The they family. have to go through the expense. They have to go to court. They have to yeah, they pay the they expense. Yeah. An autopsy. They try to talk them out of it. They got to do it all. Let's do it. Let's yeah. take a quick break right now, okay? And we'll all be right back. Do you know where the world's most secret bases are located? Do you know what spooky action at a distance means? Is there a conspiracy by aliens to prevent us from conquering space? And where is the best place in the United States to see a real UFO? Find the answers to all these questions and more in Mac Maloney's new book, Mac Maloney's Haunted Universe. Visit places you never knew existed. The Phantom Tunnels of Tokyo, the UFO Trail in South America, Ong's Hat, and the very mysterious M Triangle. Mac Maloney's Haunted Universe contains hundreds of reports on ghosts, haunted planes and ships, weird celebrity deaths, mysterious sounds, and a breakdown of every monster in America, state by state. You've heard him talk about it on the radio. Now, get all of Mac's paranormal research in one large volume. Mac Maloney's Haunted Universe, with a forward by the very famous Juan Juan. On sale now in your local bookstore or on Amazon.com. UFOs are found in Renaissance art, on ancient coins, and etched on cave walls. They're even reported in the Bible. But more surprising is when UFOs are seen the most in times of war. Through centuries, thousands of UFO sightings have been made by high-ranking officials, military pilots, and ordinary soldiers. Often, these fantastic appearances occur at the height of great battles. From World War I to D-Day to Korea, Vietnam, and beyond, military investigators are baffled. Why do UFO sightings spike so drastically during wartime? Could it be mistaken aircraft, or is someone, or something, looking in on us? In UFOs in wartime, what they didn't want you to know, Mac Maloney chronicles centuries of these incredible sightings and tries to solve the puzzle of why so many UFOs are seen while humanity is at war. Read about the scare ships, the ghost planes, and the ghost rockets, alien giants in the jungles of Vietnam, UFOs controlling our ICBM bases, dogfights with flying saucers during the Gulf War, and more. 300 pages of unbelievable stories, along with many startling photographs. That's UFOs in Wartime, What They Didn't Want You to Know, by Mac Maloney. On sale at your local bookstore or on Amazon.com. Show here on the Distant Thunder Radio Network. This is Mac Maloney. Wow, I misspoke. It's actually Mac Maloney's musical X Files uh, tonight, and uh, we're just going to wrap up a show which was really a cool show. We started off with Dr. Bob Gross, who's one of our guests. Dr. Bob, thanks for joining us, as always. Thank you for having me out there in Thank Chicago. You. Chicago's still a toddling town, is it? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Good. Um, he talked about how uh, Dr. Bob on a classified project was actually. Um, Enlisted, uh, recruited to put sounds on CD um, music. Whoops, music CDs uh, to make them sound grittier, to make them sound real. And that was very cool. And then um, after that, we had Brian Dunn, who was the drummer of Hall and Oates, and also the Daryl Hall House Band. Great musician, uh, good guy. Uh, if you like music, even just a little bit, just uh, pick, you know, watch one of Daryl House's. How do you say it there, Lois? Daryl. Daryl. Daryl's House. Daryl's House episodes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It is great. No matter what, it's always a good show. No matter no matter what music mm-hmm. guests they have. But they also have a cooking segment, which is also pretty wild, too. Would always you agree? interesting. Um, so uh, thanks to Brian Dunn. Um, and uh, also, 
Jacko Johnson, a detective on the show. Uh, I'll give us a little more information about Bobby Fuller. Bobby Fuller 4 made uh, a hit back in the 60s. I fought the law and the law won. He was found dead in a mysterious circumstances uh, shortly thereafter. We've been trying to crack the case, and we will continue to try to crack the case. Right, Jocko? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. He's on the job. Don't worry. <laughs> Chris Billius, thank you for joining us. Hey, thank you for having me. Hey, do you want to, anything I you want to? Think, go ahead, please. I, I think we should look into the manager. The manager? Yeah, yeah why? Take a closer look at it. Yeah, <laughs> manager, <laughs> agent, all that. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah. You know, <laughs> one of those guys dishonest. What are you trying to say? I, I plead the fifth. <laughs> well, is that my last I don't know. Hey, anything, uh, anything you want to plug there, Chris? Hey, Bristol Studios. Okay. We're um, opening up the new year right across from Symphony Hall. So Symphony come on Hall. Down. Yeah, right. This is a recording studio that they put in a bank, and one of the recording rooms is the vault, right? The vault. Yeah, it's yeah. awesome. Oh. <laughs> it really is. Fun. Yeah, it's a really different different place. Different from the old place. The old place had its charm, but. Yeah. Hang on. <laughs> Nothing like this new one, though. Right. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Chris, for joining us. We appreciate it. Raven, thank you for joining us, Raven. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. This was so oh. fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And a no bun night. No bun tonight. None of us wore no buns bun tonight. Night. Right. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. It's an I mean, we're almost at the point, though, where it's hat season. Finally. Oh, so it's always then, hat season for me. I can just so. cover yeah. it up. Huh. So, let, let, if I may, let me get this straight. You stop wearing white now, right? After Labor and Day. you wear hats? Is that how it's done? <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot. I mean, I never wear white because I spill everything all over me. So, there's just oh, no point. Okay. But once, it, like, uh, September, October, once the weather starts to get cooler, it's uh -huh. all hats. All hats. hats all, all the time. The time. Okay. Interesting. Okay, well. well. It saves so time on doing your hair. ties look like we could dip them in a pot and make soup for lunch. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It uh Lois reports it saves time from doing your hair if you wear a hat, right? Uh, well yes. Is this, yeah. is this like yeah. secret yeah. this That's is like secret girl everything. stuff? Secret only yeah, girls. Maybe know? we should it's, have a I mean it's not secret, but oh. it isn't secret, secret but it's from us. yeah. Okay. <laughs> they don't girl think about hacks. it raven. No. Girl, yeah, right, girl <laughs> there you hacks. go, girl right. hacks. You yeah. can have a little uh -huh. episode. <laughs> so we learned something tonight. <laughs> More than a few things. Jocko, well, thank you, Jocko, for joining us. We appreciate yeah, it. Very interesting. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. We'll talk to everyone soon. Uh, very quickly, the plugs are um, Homes for Our Troops. Homes for Our Troops is a military charity that builds homes for uh, Iraqi and Iraqi veterans and also veterans of the Afghan war who may have lost limbs, you know, um, while serving. And um, they build them a house that is easy for them to get around in low counter spaces and wider stairs and wider halls and stuff like that. And then they just give them the uh, house. No mortgage, nothing. It's theirs. They deserve it. Homes for our troops. Just uh, check them out on Google. 88 cents of the uh, your dollar goes to the charity, which is very high in the charity game these days. Uh, also, um, Ross Sharp and his mad Englishman friend, the put, friends are putting together, back together, a war plane from World War II called the Mosquito, made of wood, Put two Rolls Royce engines on the fastest thing in the wall for a long time. Some of them they didn't give guns to because they got outrun the bullets. He's putting he and his friends are putting back um, a recreation, no, a real one. They're putting it, reassembling it. And Juan Juan, wow, has um, volunteered to be the first person to go up, the first citizen civilian to go up in the plane. Wow! Wow! Yeah, without a parachute, right? <laughs> yeah. That's what he said. Yeah, that's what he said. Just we have it on on record. Right. Put a GoPro on him, and uh, let's see what happens. So anyway, um, so and so, thank you everyone for listening, and uh, we really appreciate it. we appreciate the uh, downloads and the podcast, also our uh, network channels, and on Forces Radio. So thanks for everyone for listening in, and this is Mac Maloney for the entire gang. Until you hear us next time, be safe, be happy, and be kind. And bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>